Hey, thanks for clicking in. Every single week we upload videos to our YouTube channel just for you. That's right, go ahead and hit the subscribe button so that you can get notified. And if you want just a sense of encouragement, I encourage you to watch the videos that are posted. While you're listening into this message, you may feel led to get connected to our ministry. And I'm proud to say we have multiple ways that you can do just that. So go ahead and look in our description and find out the ways that you can get connected to us. Lastly, if you feel led to sow into our ministry and sow into this word, we encourage you to do that as well. There are multiple ways that you can give to our ministry and your giving is going towards our outreaches. That's right, we are the Outreach Church and every single month we are in the community doing big things. And this is your opportunity to get connected and to sow into something that is changing our city. Thank you for watching this video. Now check this out. So we started this series last week, Bank On It. And what this series is dealing with is the promises of God. I think it's good every now and then to just be reminded of what the promises of God are and how we can tap into them. The Bible says the promises of God are yes and amen. When God gives you a promise, you can bank on it. When God gives you a promise, the Bible says in Hebrews 6, 18, there's one thing God cannot do, and that's lie. So when God gives you a promise, look at somebody and say, bank on it. And you know that it's a promise from God when you can't walk away from it, when you can't quit on it, when when it doesn't happen or it seems like it's taken forever, but something inside of you says, I got to keep grinding. I got to keep working. I got to keep reading. I got to keep studying. I got to keep loving. That is an indicator that that thing is a promise from God. If you couldn't see yourself living without it, that is a promise from God. We call it desire in the Bible. And Jesus said, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe in it and it will be given to you. Desire is hard wired for our purpose. So when you want it and you're hungry for it and you can identify how it makes God look good, that's the key. It's yours. And anything that cannot make God look good is what we call a distraction. Because if God's not in it, God can't get involved in it. So God cannot lie. And when he speaks a word, Isaiah said his word cannot return to him void. So when God gives you a word, what Isaiah is saying is take it to the bank. Don't wrestle with it no more. Start walking by faith and not by sight. Once God gives it to you, start walking in it. If God told you he's going to be a good man, start treating him like a good man, even though he's acting like trash. If God told you she's going to be a good woman, keep bringing home flowers or getting her whatever is her thing. Keep spoiling her until what God showed you matches what she's walking in. When God shows you something about the kids, keep talking to them on the level of what God told you, not the level of how they're acting. Whatever God shows you something, Noah, I'm going to fill your boat, but you have to be the one to find the wood, gather the nails. See, God has never given somebody a boat built. What he does is he gives you wood to build it. So Noah, if you have faith to give all of these years of your life up and look stupid to build something that the world has never even seen rain up until this point, and you're going to build a boat. Why do you need a boat, Noah? And where Noah lived was hundreds of miles from the nearest water. But faith says, I don't care if they laugh. God told me it's coming. How many in here can sense that God has told you something is coming? Your life doesn't match it. Things are not lining up. But God told you it's 
coming. Whether it's a job, it's coming. If it's healing, it's coming. If it's opportunity, it's coming. If it's a relationship, it's coming. If it's somebody getting saved, it is coming. If it's the pain leaving your body, it is coming coming. If God showed you the man, he's coming. If God showed you the woman, she's coming. When God shows you something, you have to be the one to take it to the bank. Because how can you expect anybody else to believe in your promise if you're so up and down with it? Say, take it to the bank. Take it, take it to the bank. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about promises that God gives all of us, but not just the promises to get us clapping, but we're going to talk about what it takes to get that particular promise. Whenever I talk to people and they tell me, you know, hey, I don't know what I'm doing in this season. I don't know what God is asking from me. I say, what character in the Bible are you in this season? Find one. Because God is not a respecter of people. If you find a person that God did something for that you're asking God to do, mimic them and watch God do it. Amen. Amen. If you tap out where Ruth kept walking, you're not meant to have Boaz. If you tap out where Elijah kept pressing, you're not meant to have a double portion. Because when you find somebody and you model them, God says, I will do for you what I did for that person. Amen. Look at somebody and say, who's your model? Who's your model? <laughs> One of the things that you will find, and today we're going to talk about the greatest promise, which is the, the Holy Spirit. It is, it is him, the Bible says, as we're going to see shortly, that the scripture says, I have not seen and ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of men the things that God has prepared for those that love him. But we know what things they are because his spirit lives within us and he shows us the deep things of God. That's what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. So if... if the Holy Spirit's job is to show us all the things that God has for us. He is the most important promise that God can give us. Amen. He is our GPS. He is our tracking system. He is the, the magnet to the magnet that God has for us. The dream, the purpose, the promise is a magnet and the Holy Spirit is a magnet and whether you know it or not, you are being pulled in a direction every day you get out of bed. Amen. But if your relationship is not strong with him, you could be within reach like manna of what you've been praying for and not see it. So he is the most important promise. But him, like so many other promises, they are found when you get in the right rooms. And get exposed. One of my favorite plays. I've seen it live. Um, I've watched it on Disney Plus. Over and over and over and over and over. Is Hamilton. How many have seen Hamilton? Wow. There's a lot of people not going to heaven. But Hamilton was so well written and portrayed. I mean, you got to watch it. It's, it's so good. But there's this one part that really jumps out to me in the play. And it's like my life story, you know. And it's this part where they start talking about the power of the room. And they say, I want to be in the room where it happens. How many know that song? Yeah. Let me give you a reminder if you've never heard that song before. I want to be in the room where it happens. I have seen since the day I got saved, one of my things that I've always been drawn to is rooms that have been bigger than me. Even when I got saved and I started, I said, how do I get involved? I started driving a church van. 
Within a year, I was in minister's classes, and then I went to Bible college, and I didn't even know what I was doing, but I just wanted to keep being in rooms that stretched me. And I'll never forget the first time I stepped into a room that I felt so small in. I mean, I felt small, but it was one of those rooms that showed me a glimpse of what God was up to in my life. And it was about eight years, nine years ago now. But every year, my spiritual father does this meeting in Dallas called his strategy meeting. And he brings all the TV companies, all the book publishing companies, all the actors that are going to be in this movie. Everybody comes to this place. It's called the strategy meeting. And it's, it's well put together. And there's presentations and trailers of movies that are coming out. And everybody that is anybody is there. And I remember when somebody took this picture, it was a, a group of pastors. And all the pastors in the circle since I got saved, I've looked up to. And you can look at the picture and see some that you may recognize. But I remember looking around and saying, how did I get here? I don't have no connections. I don't have a, a big church. I don't have a big church backing me. How did I get here from Brooklyn homes to a room full of millionaires? And I remember feeling so small. And this would be the first of many rooms, and some would be much bigger than this. I got to sit in rooms with all the living presidents and shake hands. I've gotten a chance to sit in rooms in Africa with presidents and princes and ambassadors and multi-billionaires. And it all comes from one mindset. I want to be in rooms where it happens. Yes. Because there are certain things you cannot tap into until you find the right room. The room is where promises are given. For the life of me, I can't understand how people come to a church and never try to get into any rooms. It is in the rooms where you get a chance to get the crumbs that fall from the table. My team struggles so much in the back because I have so many notes and I'm skipping all through them and I'm not reading half of them. And then afterwards, they all come in my office and say, tell us what we didn't hear. Or we have huddles before service and we go over the week prior's message and everybody's asking questions before we get the day started. Because it's one thing to hear the word. It's another thing to get into the mind of how the word was prepared. But there's certain things that cannot be given unless you make it to the room. And God has always been about rooms. With Noah, he told him to build the ark with rooms. When, when the tabernacle, which we've been studying over the last several weeks, and we're going to continue in a couple weeks because we're going to take a break and talk about something different. I'm going to continue this message on Wednesday. But we've been talking about the tabernacle and the different rooms. You had the outer court, the inner court, and the holy of holies. Solomon's temple had rooms. God has always been about rooms, and each room that you stepped into brought you into a new glory. The inner court was different than the outer court. Though the outer court had glory, the inner court had a different kind of glory. And then if you went behind the veil into the Holy of Holies, it was a whole different glory. You could die if you weren't ready for that. And that's how it is with God. He puts you in different rooms to build you up for bigger rooms. And if you try to skip the process, you will die in a room you're not ready for. God processes processes us and gets us ready for the promises by getting us into different rooms. John Maxwell said this. He said, these are three questions you always need to ask yourself. Where am I going? Who am I seeing? What am I doing? Where am I going? Who am I seeing? 
What am I doing? Where am I going? Where are you going today? Where are you going to be five years from now? Where are you going? Adam, where art thou? Where are you going? And you're not going to get there unless you're seeing somebody. Who are you talking to? And they're going to tell you what to do, so what are you doing? I heard it said like this a long time ago. People should be able to tell where you're going by what you're working on. I don't need to be a prophet to tell you you're going somewhere. I'm just going to look at what you're working on. So where are you going? Who am I seeing? And who are you seeing? And what am I, what am I doing? The scripture says for two to walk together, they must agree. Everybody you walk with is a picture of your tomorrow. If you want to know where your tomorrow is, just read your last five text messages. That's your, your tomorrow. And sadly, a lot of people come into settings looking for friends or, or other things. And what happens is they become like the people that sat on the pool porch. And it says that everybody drew to people that had sicknesses like them. The goal is not to draw to people like you. It's to do whatever you have to do to get in the room. Because when two or th where it says where, uh, for two to walk together, they must agree. A lot of times that's used for negativity or to talk about your unsafe friends. But the same thing applies to strong people. When you connect to somebody that's been there and is going somewhere... For two to walk together, they must agree. It's only a matter of time before you get there. Because you are who you walk with. So where are you going? Who are you talking to? What are you doing? There's certain things, and I'm going to move on quickly, but there's certain things that the right rooms prepare you for. And if you're taking notes, write this down. Rooms prepare you for next. Rooms prepare you for next. What do they do? How do they prepare me for next? Well, number one, they strengthen your mindset. You get into bigger rooms, you start thinking on a whole nother level. It strengthens your mindset and as a man thinketh, yeah, y'all got it. So it strengthens your mindset. Whoever you hang around with, you ever had a friend and you, they have bad habits, like they may laugh a certain way or, or, or do something quirky, and you hang around with them so much that you find yourself doing it one day? That's how it is, too, when you hang around people that are doing something. Getting in the room strengthens your mindset. It makes you strong. Getting in the room shapes your motivations. You get into the right room, now your motivations for living, your motivation for succeeding. It's shaping your motivations. Motivations come from the word motives. You start to see your motives and your motivations change. Because your motivations were so small until you got around people that talk so big. Now you're beginning to say, I could see myself living somewhere like that. I could see myself working somewhere like that. I could see myself being over a group of people like that. I could see myself marrying somebody like that. I, I, I could see my kids being like that. I could see my marriage being like, like that. The right rooms. Shape your motivations. The bigger the room, the bigger you dream. So getting in the room shapes your motivations. It, it stabilizes your moves. This is big. You ever met people that are working on 30 things but never get one thing done? <laughs> they're, 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 they're unstable. And when you get in rooms, it stabilizes you because rooms also bring accountability. So you begin to get structure set to your life. You begin to feel stable. And being stable brings security. 
stabilizes your moves, getting in the right room. What else does it do? It structures your money. I start to realize how I need to manage it better. Because when I'm not held accountable and I'm not in rooms, I get to do whatever I want to do. And God did not call me to do what I want to do. He called me a steward of what he's given me. So it begins to structure my money. It teaches me how to save and how to prepare for retirement and how to get a health care policy. And, and, and if I die, to make sure that when I die, it doesn't make people's life harder. It structures my money. And you'll never see somebody with bad spending habits get in big rooms. It brings structure to your money. What else does it do? It secures your members and your mates, team members, team mates. It secures them. It puts a circle around you that protects you, that encourages you, that's there to talk when you need to talk. It secures that when you get into the right room. You, you don't feel like you have nobody no more. The room begins to be in a way like your nest that protects you from the things coming at you because your members and your mates have the answers to what your problem is. Alone, we do not have answers, but you put a group of people around me, I have uh, uh, an advisory board. And what they do is they're all smarter than me in their professions. They all do different things. But what I do is I learn from them. And truthfully, I did this when I only had a handful of people. I took the brightest and biggest hearted people in the church. I put them on my advisory board. And you know what they did? They prepared me for that picture you saw. They taught me the language of different professions, the language of how lawyers talk, the language of how doctors talk, the language of how finance officers talk. My team taught me how to handle those opportunities. Because every answer I need, God always puts your answer within your reach. So when you got a room, who do you got to reach? It secures your members. I mean, y'all better write these down because it took me a lot to do these S's and M's. <laughs> that was the hardest part of this message. I was up all night doing this. So it structures your money. It secures your members and mates. And lastly, this one's good. It, it sharpens your mouth. You'll never see people in big rooms have loose mouths. They're trustworthy. They're secret keepers. I always tell people that share secrets with me, I say, man, trust me on this. I will die before I ever repeat what you share with me. If it's going to come out, it's going to come out, but it ain't coming out by, by me. <laughs> I, I'm going to be your secret keeper. I'm going to be the guardian of your trauma. So if it comes out, it'll never come out by me. Because when God puts you in rooms, this right here is a room. And the only reason you're still listening to me and didn't walk out during the worship is because there's something about the room that feels trustworthy. That feels like it has integrity. That feels like it can, that it walks in consistency and, and, and does what it says it's going to do. And, and, and you're hearing from the Lord. That's the only reason you're here. Otherwise, when the last worship song went out, somebody would have done the, the Baptist, the Baptist out. It sharpens your mouth. There's a really good book. If you like leadership books, you should pick it up called Tribal Leadership. It's, a, it's an amazing book. But it teaches how every new level is a different tribe. You start a new job. The new job is not the old job. It's a different tribe. It has different languages. If you go into the new job thinking it's going to be like your old job, they're going to quickly, the tribe leaders that is, they're going to quickly exit you out. You can't go to this new girl and talk to her like the old girl. 
can't treat the new guy like you treated the old guy. Every new opportunity is a different tribe, and it has a different language. And you'd be amazed how many people blow moments because they don't sit back and learn the language. If you've been in our church for any amount of time, you know our language is different than the Methodist church down the block. It doesn't mean they're wrong. It doesn't mean we're right. It's a different language. And if you try to use uproar language in that church, or if you go into that church in your skinny jeans and your T-shirt, they're going to look at you real funny because you're not in a suit that Sunday. It's, it's language. The room changes your language. Because when language isn't on one accord, it leads to confusion. There has to be a commonality with language. I've been to Africa, and in Africa alone, there are over 2,000 languages. That's why it's hard for the continent to come together. There's so many different languages. I was in Kenya, and, and in the city, everybody kind of spoke, you know, English. And they had a common language, but when we went up to the bush and met with the tribe leaders, they had a language that was different than where we were from in the city. Because there's over 2,000 different languages on the continent of Africa alone. And whenever language is not the same, it makes it hard to communicate. You know how hard it is to communicate when you go into certain places and they don't speak English? Imagine 2,000 different languages. And that's what God did with the Tower of Babel. He, he broke up the languages when he broke up the continents. So since the Tower of Babel moving forward, we haven't had one language. And many people believe the original language that Adam and Eve spoke with, because they only knew one language at the time, there was a heavenly language. And most believe Adam and Eve would have spoken in tongues before the fall. Because that is the language of heaven. And so, I don't want to get off course. But language goes together with new rooms. And whenever you get into a new room, your language would change. When Jesus was getting his boys ready for the promise of the Holy Spirit, he told them the promise would be found in a place and in a room. It was the same room where they had the Last Supper. It's referred to as the upper room. I've been to the upper room. I've shared this before. There's an upper room, and that means there must be a what? A lower room. And what's in the lower room in Jerusalem? It's the body of King David. His bones are in the lower room. And people are there all hours of the day and night, bowing down and putting notes in David's casket or coffin. The upper room is right above the great giant slayer himself. And Jesus would leave on day 40 after raising from the dead. And matter of fact, I'll read it to you. It's found in Acts chapter 1, and I'll start right around verse 4. It says, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Here it is. But wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard of me. Now, you can't breeze over that because he said, I want you to go to Jerusalem, not Galilee. I want you to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise. Now, they would have to wait 10 days. 10 days for the promise. They, they've heard Jesus teach about the promise. He, he said that he will come, the Holy Spirit will come to comfort you. He will teach you all things. He is your advocate. He, they, they've heard about the promise. They heard how Ezekiel said that eventually the law would be done away with and the new law would be the spirit placed in our, in, our, in, our, in our souls and operating in our hearts 
That's what Ezekiel says. It'll no longer be hearts or stone tablets no more, but the law will be in our hearts. Ten days. I want you to wait for the promise. Ten days. He doesn't tell them ten days, but, you know, it's ten days that they have to wait for the promise. In Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the last place they want to be. They just killed Jesus. They, Peter denied Jesus for a reason. It was tough. They wanted to kill anybody tied to Jesus. And here I see a glimpse of how to get a promise. Your promise will always require you to wait in a situation you want to run from. I'm sending you back to where you don't want to be. Run if you want, but you won't get the promise. So I'm sending you to Jerusalem, and I want you to wait. Those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. I want you to wait. I'm teaching you how to stand still and not run no more. Verse 5, he says, For John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they were come together, they asked of him, Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel, to, the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It's none of your business. It's not for you to know. Why, why, why? Because we have the propensity to always want to know how long and we need the date and the time. And we are so structured that we give God no room to move. So Jesus says, I'm not telling you when. I'm not telling you when you're going to be married. I'm not telling you when you're going to be healed. I'm not telling you when the money's going to come. I'm not telling you when the kids are going to get it together. I'm not telling you when I'm going to come through and help you keep the home. I'm not telling on you. It's telling you. It's not for you to know. Because if God tells you everything, why would you need faith? Faith comes in when I say, I know he loves me too much to let me stay in this. I know he loves me too much to let this be the end of my story. I know he loves me too much to let me die lonely. I know he loves me too much to let me stay sore and aching. I know he loves me too much to let my heart stay shattered for more than it's supposed to be. I know he loves me too much to let me stay in this situation and cry my myself to sleep. See, sometimes you got to look at your situation and say, God loves me too much for this. God's not going to let me stay in this. This must be something that is meant to get me where he needs me to be because he loves me too much. I've been too consistent. I've been too faithful. I've been good to God and I know God's going to be good back to me. Look at somebody and say, he loves you too much. The faith comes in when you say, God, I know you love me too much to let it take me out. So rather than ask you when it's going to end, I'm going to start asking you, what are you trying to teach me? He says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons, but understand this. The Father has the power to turn it. Doesn't matter how bad it is, he can turn it. Doesn't matter how crazy it looks, he can turn it. How many have seen God turn some things in your life? Things you never thought would turn. Things people said would never turn. Things your history said would probably cause things to never turn. But God stepped in and turned it when he felt like it and shows you to shut your mouth because I can take you from winter to summer and skip spring. I can take you from fall to spring and skip winter. Why? Because I'm God. I can do suddenly in your life. I can do instantly in your life. I can speak something and it will happen the exact way I said for it to happen. For somebody today on Pentecost Sunday, God is saying, heal, 
For somebody, God is saying delivered. For somebody, God is saying the resources are coming. For somebody, God is saying relationships are in your future. For somebody, God is saying opportunity is on the way. If God speaks a word, he cannot lie because he is God. Say, speak Jesus. He says, but you shall receive power. What's going to give me the power? The weight. The weight gives me power. I've never seen somebody that gets something quick have power. When I sold drugs on the street, I would eye people up. I still got a bad habit of doing it. I just want to see if you're as tough as you're talking. Maybe it's from boxing. You know, I used to eye boxers up before my fights. But as a preacher, I'm eyeing people up for different things. I do it with preachers. I look at them, and I see them funny, and I see them acting cute and using analogies. And I look at them, and they're I say, man, a demon would kick your butt. Because I don't see no power. And when you get things quick, you often have no power. I am so grateful that when I started this church, nobody helped me. We had nothing. And when I say nothing, I mean nothing. We had none of this. We had a little budget. We collected maybe $200 in tithes and offerings a year. I never saw our ministry handling millions of dollars. I, we went from a couple hundred dollars a week to a million dollar plus ministry. I never saw that. And all of my friends that got things quick when the pandemic came, you know what happened to their ministries? They crumbled. And we just kept feeding people because we stuck with the girl that got us into the dance. Outreach is what we do. So we said that if God is going to give us power to get through this pandemic... We are going to do outreach. We're going to give money we don't have. We are going to put hundreds of thousands of dollars, not into just the city of Baltimore. We literally put 200,000 plus dollars into just Owings Mills every single week, putting bags of groceries and cars that were lined up to Royal Farms. We stuck with what got us here. And while other churches were playing safe because they were scared, I seen God move. And I knew that if God can trust me, he'll get me through this. And he got me through it. And he got us through it. And you know, I had friends that had much smaller ministries. They were doing funerals every week in, during the pandemic. Not because I, I would do any of them. But we didn't have one person in our ministry die of COVID. I've learned that it's not about the fluff. It's about the power. I could have a band up here. I, we have enough money. We could pay a band to come up here. We could have all this other stuff. I do plan in the next two years to get a bigger facility. That's what we're working towards now. We could have all of that stuff. But that would mean that like other places, we wouldn't do no outreach. Because many people don't know to have all of that stuff is about five to six thousand dollars a week. And I'd rather do outreach and help people. Why? Because that's what I found releases God's power. Yes. It's waiting, but those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. The word wait does not mean like, all right, God. It's the same word in Hebrew that is used for a waiter. It means that while I'm waiting on God, I have the pen in my hands and I'm doing whatever he needs me to do. He says, in the wait, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, Sumeria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. He says, look, it's going to start scary. 
But every time you're obedient, it's going to get big. It's going to go to Judea. It's going to go to Samaria. It's going to go to the uttermost parts of the earth. Like he told Joshua, I'm going to enlarge your territory. He, he's telling them that your territory is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. That's why I need you to wait. You need power to get bigger. But understand, I'm not making you wait just to torture you. I'm trying to power you up so that you can experience all that I want to do with your life. He said, you're going to go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. Here's the good news. So he told me I'm going to go to Jerusalem or start at Jerusalem and I'm going to end up in Judea and then Samaria and then the uttermost parts of the earth. Guess what that means? When Jerusalem gets scary and Jerusalem says they're going to kill me and Jerusalem says they're going to hang me on a cross, he can't lie. So when he tells me I'm going to Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth, that means no matter how bad Jerusalem gets, Jerusalem will not be the end of my story. So they can growl, they can attack me, they can say what they want to say, they can post what they want to post, but if God told me I got to go bigger, I can't die in small. I dare somebody to start saying to yourself, I will not die in small. My life is too small. This attack is too small. God will not let me die in small. So if I get to Jerusalem, it can't touch me. If I get to Judea and they don't like me, well, they got to get over it because they can't touch me. If I get to Samaria and they want to take me out, let them throw their best shot because I still got a world to step into. Look at somebody and say, your life is going to get bigger. And like Elijah with Elijah, he disappeared into the clouds. And they stood, stood there staring. And the angel says, why do you stand here gazing? This is not a gazing moment. This is a moving moment. You've been staring too long. This is a claim it moment. This is a get going moment. You got 10 days to get on one accord. You got 10 days before this thing happens. Why 10? Because 10 is the number of the law. And when you guys are in the upper room, it's going to be the fulfillment of the prophecy that the 10 commandments will now begin to move on the in the spirit and touch men's hearts. Pentecost, 50 days. It is the feast of weeks. It is the perfect time for God to move because people from all over the world will be in Jerusalem. They will be selling food, selling garments. They will be selling animals. People will be from all over the world. It's like Preakness. People will be set up at every corner. It's the moment. See, God had you wait because it wasn't about you. He was waiting for the right moment. And I know you wanted it a year ago. And I know you wanted it five years ago. And I know you thought it was going to happen with your last marriage. And I know you thought it was going to happen with your last job. But God says, I was waiting for the moment. I needed this thing to hit with your life. And it could not hit unless people saw you die and get resurrected. So I waited for the moment. The moment. The mo because when the moment hits, I will suddenly shift stuff. When, when, when the moment hits, I, I will suddenly start turning stuff. When the moment hits, I will immediately begin to answer your prayers. When, when it's your season, 
it's your season. Why? Because my father has the power. So when it's your season, it's your season. And it doesn't matter how big and how bad it feels or how scared you are. When it's your moment, it's your moment. God says in your moment, you can't be sore like this. In your moment, you can't be depressed like this. In your moment, I ain't going to have you lonely. In your moment, I'm going to deal with your family. In your moment, I'm going to teach you how to talk on the level that I'm taking you to. When it's your moment, it's your moment, but I cannot give you the blessing until I set the stage for your life. He is setting the stage and people are coming from all over the world and they don't know they're only coming to a stage that God is setting. Oh, wait a minute, David. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. That's why I got to go back to Jerusalem. My enemies are there, which means my table is there. Stop running from your enemies. God is saying they are needed for your table. All the people that laughed and talked about you, they are needed. They are your dinner invitations to your blessing. So I got to send you back to where I pulled you from so the people that doubted you can have something to shut their mouths about. While Jesus is taking off, people are traveling from Asia and Rome and all over Europe and all from Africa because he's going to make this thing hit. And like the animals that got onto the boat with Noah, if you do what I tell you to do, I'll draw what's needed to fill it. All you got to do is get things in order. And they began to get things in order. Because you got to remember they're one disciple short from being on one accord. Remember Judas, he's, he's, he's no longer with them. And Judas kept them from being on one accord. Whenever there was moments to bring the team together, like the washing of Jesus' feet by the woman, Judas would be the one to say, couldn't we use that money for outreach? Judas was the one that always brought division to the team. When Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Judas had to go. Why did Judas have to go though? Because Judas fulfilled his purpose. See, your Judas was sent into your life not to push you to the cross, but push you through the cross. There are some people that are sent into your life to attack you. Because what they don't realize is that they're only attacking you because God doesn't want you to get comfortable. So Judas is part, Jesus purposely picked Judas. And Jesus, Jesus was so focused on his purpose that when his buddy Peter spoke up one time, Jesus said, get behind thee, Satan. And when Judas kissed him on the cheek, he said, friend, you know you're ready for a new room when you start calling your enemies friends and your friends enemies. Your comfort will only hurt me in this season. When Judas is pushing me to my purpose, Peter, you're trying to hold me back with a good heart, but you're trying to hold me back from the room and the seat my father has for me. I wonder today who may have a good heart, but they're holding you back from your seat. This is where it gets quiet. And they're the people that say, take it easy. It's okay. You need a break. No, God told me to work six days and only break one day. Not break six days and work one day. You only get one life to make it count. And when it's over, it's over. I tell people, I will sleep when I die. But until I get to where God showed me, you better believe. My team will tell you, I'll work like nobody. I am texting all hours of the night. I am thinking. I am strategizing. I am coming up with ways to pay our bills and help our partners out when they need outreach money. It is never about me. 
Because when God gives you an assignment, Jesus said it like this, my meat is to do the work of my father or the will of my father and finish it. I get fueled where other people get hungry. You got 10 days to get this room on one accord. The reason Judas had to leave your life, you ready for it? Is because God could not bless your life while you were all over the place. And Judas was keeping you from being on one accord. Judas was keeping your life from having a rhythm. And as long as Judas was in your life, you didn't have a rhythm. You were just a note. So God had to remove Judas so that the suddenly could happen. And while they had the 10 days, they were trying to find his replacement. And they wanted somebody that saw Jesus die and saw Jesus resurrect. So they picked a guy named Matthias. I'm going to talk about it in a couple weeks how they chose wrong. But they, they, they chose a guy named Matthias that at least saw what they saw so that when they went into the upper room, they would be on one accord. Thank you, God, for not coming too quick. Thank you, God, for giving me time to get things in order, to get things established, to get things ready so that when my suddenly came, I wouldn't miss it. So that when my suddenly came, I wouldn't be out of position. So that when my suddenly came, I'd have the language that is needed for the next level. Because when they came out, it says every person heard them speak in their own language. People from all over the world were hearing Peter speak in their language. They had no sign language people. They had no interpreters. It was just God taking Peter's voice and allowing everybody in the world to see it. Look what the room did. The room made their voice able to go global. Amen. What are you doing to get in the room? And it says that when they were in the room, suddenly, 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 they were on one accord in one place. Suddenly, there came a, a sound. Not, not, not from down the street. A sound from heaven. It's like Elijah when it says that he said, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. When heaven is moving, it's not a sound that you hear with your ears. It's a sound that you hear with your spirit. I've learned in life to get excited for what I hear in my spirit. I don't need to hear it with my ears. I just need to hear it with my spirit. Spirit. If God tells me I'm blessed in my spirit, I start praising him. If God tells me I'm going to be prosperous in my spirit, I start praising him. If God tells me bigger is coming into my life, I just start praising him. If God tells me I'm going to get out of this apartment and own my first home, I just start praising him. If God tells me I'm going to get a car and say goodbye to this bus pass, I just start praising him. If God tells me I'm going to be healed and the doctor tells me to get my affairs in order I just start praising them when God starts speaking I just start praising him I don't need it to line up I don't need it to look like it's going my way if heaven gives me a sound I just start screaming I just start dancing I just start clapping I just start raising my hand all by myself with nobody around I just get into my rhythm with God and I know that if I praise him for what he's allowing me to hear in my spirit my faith is going to enable it to eventually be in my hands and be my reality what are you hearing in your spirit this Sunday morning this Pentecost Sunday that the Holy Spirit is trying to move on that the Holy Spirit is trying to fix that the Holy Spirit is trying to turn trying to work out trying to get in order trying to promote trying to heal, trying to stretch, trying to get it in order. What are you hearing? It's a sound from, 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 from heaven. And it was as a rushing, 
Mighty wind, I'm trying to teach you why you got to get in the room because in the room is, is where you hear the sound. Elizabeth would tell you it's in the room where your dead baby gets resurrected. It's, it's in the room where you hear the sound. If you don't get in the room, you miss the sound. Yes, yes, yes. It's like a mighty rushing wind. The, the disciples, if you know their story, I'm going to be done in four minutes. They didn't like wind. Remember when they were on that boat heading to the Gadarenes? It says there was a demonic storm. It was a demonic storm. There was a demon inside the man, a bunch of demons, and those demons were trying to keep Jesus from getting to the shore because they knew what Jesus would do. Like, 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 like the enemy has been trying all your life to keep Jesus from getting to you because he knows if Jesus gets you, everything changes. They didn't like wind, man. They screamed with wind. But the difference between that wind and this wind is this wind comes from heaven. And the reason you have to get into the room is because you need to know that when the wind starts blowing, that it's coming from heaven. I'm okay if I know it's coming from heaven. I freak out if I think it's coming from hell. Because if it's coming from heaven, I know that it's not sent to hurt me, it's sent to make me better. It was like a mighty rushing wind. And it says, and, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. They were sitting in the house and it filled it because whatever God is in, God fills. He's your partner. Whatever he's in, he fills. Whatever he's not in, he doesn't fill. I can almost guarantee, I heard Dr. Charles Stanley, who went to be home with the Lord. I listen to everybody. And he said, I've never had somebody come to my office and ask for help that was tithing. He said, in 50 years of ministry, I never had somebody ask the church for help that was tithing. Everybody that ever asked for a handout has usually been in a situation where they weren't tithing. And the ones that were, man, get behind them because God's going to bless you for being a blessing to them. But he said probably 80 to 90% or so. Because when you come into partnership with God and you're giving God your resources and you're giving God your time, whatever you give, God fills. The challenge of life is to get God in everything tied to you. Getting him involved with your family, getting him involved with your career, getting him involved with your money. If you get God in it, he fills it. So the house is filled. And it, 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 this is the part I like. It says, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues, not, not tongues of fire, but fire is the closest thing they could use to describe it. Like, like, like as a fire. Like, it's not fire, but it's like fire. It's heaven, so you really can't put into words what heaven's doing. It's like when God would use things like the arm of the Lord. It don't mean the actual arm of the Lord. He's just using something to help us understand or, or God repenting. He's not repenting. He's just trying to help us understand his decision. He's using things that our human minds can relate to. So they're just like, well, I don't know. It's like fire. But what I love here is the mouth is so small, the Bible says. It's a small thing, James says. And when you get into the right room, God will set fire to your small. The tongue, the Bible says, is the smallest member. God will set fire to your small. All through the scripture, you never see God setting fire to big. He didn't set Goliath down with a big rock or a big sword. He didn't use, you know, a sword to split the Red Sea. He used Moses' little staff. 
He used a little boy's lunch to feed 20,000 people. He used a widow's oil to, to, to provide for her and stretch to get her through a whole family. He used the jawbone of an ass with Samson. God always sets fire to small when you get in the room. And there appeared unto them tongues like as fire. And it sat on them. Holy like the song said, sit on us, Holy Spirit. It sat on them. And you know what sitting, the Holy Spirit sitting on a person does? It's what we call favor. It's the Holy Spirit sitting on you like Jesus sat on the colt. He rode into the city. And it was a moment. It was a moment. The room has shifted everything about them. The room has changed their minds. How can you be the same? I know it changed their mind because Peter would go outside and preach so strong, thousands of men would get saved. This room changed their mind. The room shaped their motivations. They were all in from this point forward. We are here today because they were all in. If they would have said peace out, Jesus' message would have died with them. It changed their motivations. They were no longer denying him. They were dying for him. It stabilized their moves. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost. My moves have stability now. I know exactly where I'm supposed to be. Stabilize their moves. It brings structure to your money. They were there during the first fruit heart, or, or the feast of weeks. The first, the first fruit was before that at Passover. They were there at the feast of weeks where people were bringing their first fruits. And they were the first fruits of the church. And they would go out literally and start setting structure to money in the church. It's, the room has changed them. They're on one accord now. They have secured their members and mates. They are no longer wondering who's for me and who's against me. They are on one accord in one place. And it has sharpened their mouth. They ain't denying Jesus no more. They are going out there and telling people how it is. And everybody is hearing in their own language. And saying it is amazing. This is God. This is why you got to get in the room. Because you want people when you walk into a room to say, it is God. They wouldn't be here if it wasn't for God. That's why your life has been so hard. God has been setting the stage so that when somebody like you walks in, it is God. When somebody like you becomes the head and not the tail. It is God. When everybody that knows you looks at you, they say, it is God. All of this happened when they got in the room. Pentecost Sunday is a reminder that being in the room matters. So, where are you going? Who are you talking to? What are you working on to get into the room? What room? The room where it happens. Today, my challenge is for you to find your room. Because everything you're worried about, Jesus said, don't take no thought for your life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. What's he saying? Throw your life at getting in the right rooms. The rooms that teach you more about him. Because if you learn more about him, your life has to grow. Amen. So where are you going? Who are you seeing? What are you doing? And 
I know you're waiting. But trust me, God is setting the stage for your suddenly.